morning, everybody. Such beautiful surroundings for a Wednesday morning. So a very warm welcome to Breakfast with Arup. My name is Farah, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Leader for Buildings London. And so to our speaker this morning, as a young man, Nigel enjoyed the arts and sciences. While searching for a degree that combined both, he found architecture engineering at Leeds University, which also offered a year out studying at Penn State University in the States. In hindsight, Nigel perceives that this degree was quite remarkable, as it was designed to teach the art and science of designing buildings. Nigel first learnt about Arab while studying the history of modern architecture. Learning about buildings such as the Pompidou Centre and Lloyd's of London, he knew that one day he would like to join Arab as this would give him the opportunity to work on these types of exceptional buildings. After five years of working in London where he gained his chartership, he started to look for pastures new. He transferred to the New York office, flying into JFK Airport. His first project was to refurbish a terminal building at JFK. Eight years later, he actually flew out of a brand new terminal building at JFK. The client obviously had a significant change of heart. It was in New York City when Nigel discovered that the name of Arup was less well known. And as the office grew from 20 people to 220, Whilst hiring local talent, it was rather ironic that this is where Nigel had to start to share the philosophy of total design. Nigel realised that total design does require you to think, behave and design differently and that it just doesn't happen and it is actually almost a mindset. Drawn back to London by the design community here in our city, Nigel worked with architects such as Richard Rogers, David Chipperfield, and Zaha Hadid, continuously trying to influence design and design teams with this philosophy. Nigel describes this as a continuous challenge, and at some point his curiosity, and it has to be said, his thirst for learning began to question why total design, where did these ideas come from, and why not something else? His curiosity led him to the Ove Arab archive in Cambridge, where all of Ove's papers are held. Trying to find the ideas that underpin the key speech which Ove delivered in 1970, this is where Nigel discovered over 300 documents written by Ove, which provides a greater insight into his thinking. Nigel then undertook to edit, publish a collection of his most lucid papers titled Ove's Philosophy of Design, quite a Herculean effort indeed. After 27 years with Arup, Nigel now leads the buildings group in London and seeks to practice and study design in his day-to-day -day role. So I'm really, really, really very happy to introduce the reasonably charming Nigel Tonks. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> So, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, what, what a magnificent space uh, for a talk and uh, quite an incredible backdrop. I'm really immensely grateful to the V&A for putting on uh, this wonderful exhibition and especially for calling it Engineering the World. What a fantastic title. It sounds great, doesn't it? Perhaps we might start by removing those two columns there. So... Um, I believe it's the first retrospective on, on Arab, and there's loads and loads of interesting things to see in the exhibition, so I hope you'll find time to go along and enjoy it after my talk. So after that intro, you won't be surprised that my talk's about total design. Um, it's absolutely central to the aims of the firm. Um, it's also the source of inspiration for these talks. So this month, we thought we'd take the direct approach and tackle total design head on and bringing it down here today. Thank you for making this special trip. So in my title, I switched philosophy for Enigma because, well, after 20-something uh, years of designing and building, studying, and even teaching total design, quite frankly, I'm still trying to figure it out. I'm reasonably confident that I'm not alone here I think if you ask any of my colleagues who are here today what is total design, 
I guarantee you any one of them will confidently tell you what it is. However, no two answers will be the same. Scratch below the surface and you start to discover some ambiguities, contradictions and ironies. And maybe it's these enigmas that make for a good philosophy. But despite these enigmas and the huge <clears throat> social and technological change over the past 70 years, I'll end my talk with a brief look at the relevance of total design today. I think it still holds tantalizing insight for us. So first things first, what is total design? And where did Ove get these ideas from? Let's go back briefly to philosophy. We want philosophy to tackle the really big questions in life, to give us the big ideas. We want it to tell us why is the world here, how does it work, and what is it that we should do? And these are the kinds of questions that Ove set about trying to answer as a young man studying philosophy at university. What are we supposed to do? And later as an engineer, how should we go about doing it? In fact, I've spent a lifetime trying to answer these questions. And for him, total design was, I think, possibly the closest he came to answering them. His aim was to make a built environment that was worth having, one that positively influences how humans live and work and play. Designing things that were merely on time, functional, affordable, was not sufficient. It was our duty to reject mediocrity and to strive for excellence. And by excellence, he meant a composite quality of a whole set of other things, of a whole raft of, of other criteria, other really important things. And here are some of them, social purpose, respect for the environment, conservation of, of resources, beauty, efficiency, robustness, and so on. Striving for excellence demands an holistic approach, not picking from this list, but going for all of these things at the same time. That, for Ove, was excellence. That was the aim. So how should we get there? when no one can agree on what it is they want, when the world is becoming more and more complicated and technology is rapidly changing. New materials and new processes were continually widening the field of possibility. We are forced to specialize. No individual could hope to be familiar with the complete range of technical possibilities. He said, it cannot be surveyed by a single mind. His answer to this was teamwork. It sounds very simple, but actually he wasn't just talking about banding groups of people together, but something much more intimate. People coming together to form a composite mind. So total design is striving for excellence in shaping a better world for people to live in. And achieving that by working really closely together in teams to achieve this holistic approach. Now, uh, my colleagues might have said something slightly different, uh, but I think, I think that we'd all uh, agree that that's, that's a reasonable summary. So I think it's interesting to look at where Ove might have got these ideas from. As a student, Ove studied classics and modern philosophers from Aristotle to Kant. He tells us little about this in his writing, but there are references to Aristotelian unity, to Kant's categorical imperative, to Hume on a standard of taste. Fortunately for us, he abandoned academic philosophy, and turned instead to the practical art of engineering. He felt that academic philosophy was too inward looking, and he believed that the pursuit of moral and ethical inquiry needed to be grounded 
in the real world. However, he remained obsessed with the idea of thought and action, action informing thought, thought informing action. And his legacy, therefore, is both his writings and his projects. And I think you can learn from both. As he turned to the practical arts, so shall we. And let's start with this building here. The V&A was founded in the mid 19th century by Henry Cole to establish a cultural and educational institution with the aim of improving the standard of art and design in British industry. And it was paid for by the profits from the 1851 Great Exhibition. Now we all know Paxton's design and just before he came forward with this late submission, the competition had already stalled. The architects of the day had proposed concepts that were 40 to 70% over budget. They were based on rational engineering frames, but they were clad in traditional architectural masonry, and they could not be built in time for the exhibition. Paxton joined up with contractors Fox Henderson, and between them they promised to deliver a spectacular exhibition space that could be easily disassembled and removed at the end, and they would deliver it in under six months and 15% under the budget. Paxton rejected the architectural norms of the day and he introduced mass prefabrication by creating a, a glass tablecloth over an iron frame. This extruded form, totally reliant on glass and iron, was a groundbreaking technology. It imported French and German glass making techniques which enabled them to fabricate panels a third larger than previously made in Britain. And Henderson's invented machines not only to manufacture the cast iron frame, but he also invented machines such as trains that ran on rails on the roof to speed up the installation process. Here was a building as a system. It expresses its method of fabrication, its assembly, as well as its use. Cost, speed, innovation, delight, ease of removal, all of this makes the Crystal Palace a great building just as it would today. And although not yet coined by Ovara, who was not yet born, uh, Crystal Palace is an early example of total design and a huge public success. It was a complete departure from the object fixated architecture of the period. And the British architectural elite rejected this as architecture, dismissing it as a masterpiece of science. Ruskin called it a greenhouse plus some very ordinary algebra. Crystal Palace gave light to the notion that architecture was the art of building and construction was the science of building. With the building industry caught in this schism, it was nearly 100 years before Ovarup would call time on this idea. Ov was shocked when he came to Britain in 1923, and he was shocked to find engineers had such low status, and they'd virtually disappeared from public recognition. Architects were presenting themselves as the unchallengeable artist, the dictator of the design, and it was they alone who should consult with the client to find out what their needs were. This was a situation that Ove found indefensible, and he rejected the idea of a subordinate engineer as much as he did an unchallengeable artist. Broadly, he rejected any notion of natural boundaries between professions. They were man-made things of convenience to help us focus. But architect, engineer, scientist, artist, these concepts themselves become barriers to progress. Central to his philosophy of total design, then, was the seamless bond between professionals, between architects, engineers, and builders. A bond he later called a marriage. Teamwork, he said, was a political and a psychological challenge. Ove started the firm in 1946, after the end of the Second World War, and society was devastated by the war. In Britain, under Attlee, we set about rebuilding by establishing the welfare state and the nationalisation of uh, 
utilities and major infrastructure. Now this was two years before the establishment of the National Health Service and a year before the school leaver age was raised to 15. So the massive task of rebuilding society lay before industry. And this played into modern architecture's utopian claims to make a better, healthier world. It was also the dawn of social housing. An estimated three quarters of a million new homes were urgently needed to replace those that had been damaged by bombing. This was the era of prefab bungalows. Contractors deployed their ingenuity and wartime manufacturing capability, exploited new materials to deliver this necessary housing. Aluminium frame prefab modular housing like this was designed to roll off production one every 12 minutes. And Arup worked on a steel version. Delivered to site in sections, these things came with fitted kitchens, bathrooms, indoor loos, running hot water, electric lighting. They were even delivered with wallpaper and curtains. Designed as temporary solutions, a number of these lovingly survive today. And they might not look much by our modern standards, but in their day, people loved them. I read that Neil Kinnock's parents were allocated one, and that they said, a fitted fridge, a kitchen table that folds into the wall, and a bathroom. It was like living in a spaceship. So much humbler than the Crystal Palace, I think these examples, are, these are perfect examples of the essence of total design. And these things could only have been achieved by teams of architects and engineers, manufacturers, contractors, haulage companies, all working extremely closely together to redefine the, the traditional form of the house. Other influences came from his friendship with European architects such as Gropius, Corbusier, Lebetkin, Goldfinger. And while Ovarup studied engineering, Gropius led the Bauhaus School in Weimar, and it was Gropius who was seeking a new expression for design in the industrial era, first coined the phrase total architecture, a total work of art, and emphasizing interconnectedness of art, of the art and the craft of making things. In the year that Ove graduated, Corbusier published Towards a New Architecture. In it, he urged architects to learn from the aesthetics of engineering and to turn away from the past. Engineers, embracing new technology, built ships and grain silos in simple, efficient, and functional forms. From America, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. This was a book that exposed the environmental harm caused by the modern industrial activity, and it kicked off the modern environmental movement. And one uh, last example here, which is, which is one of my favorites. I mean, there are, there are clearly lots of influences on O, but this, this one's one of my favorites. Um, the influence of a, of a friend and a contemporary, Buckminster Fuller, who published Instruction Manual for Spaceship Earth. And in it, Fuller describes a planet as a mechanical vehicle hurtling through space. Its resources are finite, but it requires maintenance. If we don't keep it in good order, it will cease to function. Fuller reminds us that the whole of the system is greater than the sum of the parts. And he points out that humanity's trend towards ever greater specialization denies individuals the ability to oversee the whole system. Now, if we fail to comprehend how our different silos of knowledge interrelate, we will lose our ability to deal with change and to adapt. On our vehicle, he said, over-specialization will lead to extinction. And his conclusion was that only by Earth's crew working closely together can we hope to preserve our existence. So that's the easy bit. Uh, now let's scratch away a little bit below the surface and look at some of the ambiguities and inconsistencies. And why are we doing this? Well, science teaches us that it's interesting to take a critical perspective. And we might learn something. Up to now, I would say that 
the academic fraternity have not really adopted total design as a field of study in academic philosophy. In 2006, O's biographer, the academic philosopher, emeritus philosopher Peter Jones, claimed that Ove dumbed down his ideas to help others understand him. His technical audience often failed to comprehend him. His acolytes blindly adopted the bits that they understood, and his critics ran away. Having read through Ove's papers, I think he does use very plain English. It is very easy to comprehend, and he does stay away from technical philosophical references, but perhaps that is to avoid scaring the horses. How many of us have had a university philosophical training? I think it is fair to say, however, that his ideas do struggle to develop, and perhaps no one was sufficiently well equipped to argue with him. The irony, I might see it as an irony, that in order to be able to argue with him, the engineering and architectural and building community would have had to take up the academic philosophy that he rejected for practical life. I think another enigma is, is the name. He never really settled on what to call it. Uh, in his writing, he flip-flops between total architecture and total design, and they're more or less interchangeable. And he, he never really properly explains the distinction or difference. Should we think of Ovarup's total design separately from Gropius's total architecture? I think, as well as in his writings, there's some enigmas in his projects. Utzon's vision for Sydney Opera House was generated with no engineering input. It drew in some of the greatest engineering minds for six years, solving the incredible problems that were created by the architecture. It was delivered 10 years late. It was 14 times over budget. And by the end of the process, the architect and the engineer weren't talking to one another. So, you know, it's perhaps not surprising that it was during this torrid time of design and construction that Ove became the most vociferous in his passion about professionals working collaboratively together. If it were an example of total design, perhaps it would have been a triumph more equally shared by all members of the team. Perhaps acoustically the best opera house in the world. Perhaps delivered on time and on budget. But it might not have looked like this. It is a masterpiece of science and architecture and maybe Ruskin would have described it as a beautiful box with some extraordinary algebra. I think the interesting thing is we can all name architecturally derived spectacular buildings that have been enabled by the invisible hand of engineers. They may not be efficient. Some of them may not even work that well. But they've gone on to achieve a real lasting success in the world. Can we name examples of total design? One last example, Ove was proud of Kingsgate Bridge, and rightly so. It's elegant, efficient. It's cunningly built on either side of the river and then twisted and interlocked in place, an ingenious design, sensibly built. And even Ove himself was forced to admit that with himself as engineer and architect, it was a much simpler task than designing a complicated building like a hospital where the brief and the stakeholders and the expert advisors will add to the complexity of the task. He reluctantly admitted that teamwork, this political and psychological challenge, was so idealistic that perhaps it could never or rarely ever be fully realized in practice, but that it was still worth striving for. So where does that leave us today? Ove's ideas have changed the face of modern engineering. I think if you check out the Mind Over Matter exhibit on the fourth floor, just above the, the main entrance, you'll see the work of other contemporary uh, engineers from the city that were perhaps influenced by his thinking. And by the end of the 20th century, design, the word design, has come to embrace all 
creative human activity. I think as was really beautifully illustrated by the, the Olympic opening ceremony where so much of our, our creative talent from choreography and music, uh, from the Industrial Revolution, uh, the, the NHS, so much of our creativity was put out there on display. And I think Ove would have been pleased to think that total design would therefore have now this wider application. Spaceship Earth is now even more complex. Our lives depend on vast interconnected systems that we hardly begin to fathom. Complex global issues like uh, security and climate change, conservation, demographics, immigration, these can only be tackled by global teams working closely together as composite minds, which makes something of a mockery of our current political situation. Clients aren't interested in complexity. They want, what they want is capability. And so the small things that we design are often a part, a small part of their means to deliver that capability. So we must remember to design those things considering the whole. Specialization and fragmentation is, become synonymous with modernity. This was a, a typical building team when I started in the 80s. And this is one that I'm working on today. I'm sure we all subscribe to the feeling that somehow our world might be held back by silos, not just in politics, but in our professions, perhaps in our organizations. The CEO of Hewlett Packard said, if HP knew what HP knows, we would be three times more productive. So it's still a political and psychological challenge working in teams. Total design calls for us to break out of our silos and to not be limited by our labels and to be curious about the world and about others. Sydney Opera House was designed on a computer the size of a small room. Taichung Opera House here was designed on a laptop. As our designs become databases and our buildings migrate off into cyberspace, Wi-Fi anywhere access, virtual reality tools, these things are going to disrupt the very notion of how teams assemble, come together, and interact. These things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, parametric modeling, these are replacing human thought. They're changing how ideas are formed. They're changing how choices are made. Components will be printed on site and assembled by a robot, just like the, the um, installation by Achim Mendes, you can see out in the courtyard here. And with crowdsourcing, our clients can simply Google the answers that they need. The old paradigm, quality, speed, price, has been replaced by perfect, now, and free. In such a world, how do we make the time to think about design, to challenge the questions that we're set, and to challenge one another? I think O's instinct for the social imperative is as strong as ever. What would happen if everybody else did what we do? Would that serve humanity? I think difficult though it may be, excellence is still worth striving for. So as you walk around the, uh, the exhibit this morning, please think about this quote from O's contemporary, the great American designer, Charles Eames. In the end, everything is connected. It's the quality of the connections themselves which is the key to quality per se. Thank you. Well, I think that it was uh, quite interesting and uh, to be refreshing, uh, get a reminder of uh, about uh, total design and how we, it actually made me think of how in everyday we forget about this and we are actually sorting out the everyday problems and you focus quite much in one single thing and we forget to have that overall vision and uh, think about uh, 
grander things that it sounded like uh, philosophy, uh, uh, the good of society, and other other things that are more they surpass the project and they become um, uh, something else that is more important. And it's it's nice to get that that tickle and be reminded that there's more than uh, just solving problems in such a, a specific way. Well, I was uh, literally thinking we have now a, a quick stu a study that we're doing for a, for a new building and I was just thinking that we need to, rather than just being so pragmatic or sort a problem by giving a, a very straight answer to try to be more deep and, uh, and think about uh, things that in inspire us and even from beauty to uh, reasons that they transcend the, the rationale and that they can be more like philosophical or... or it would be nice to, to trigger that and push it uh, and make the project be more than just a solution. I thought it was very thought-provoking. and some, uh, You don't really realise how much Arabs have done and the complexity of the business, not just of Arabs' business, but the built environment as a whole. And the teamwork issue uh, really strikes a chord. And everything has to be done with teamwork and trying to get the teams to work together is, is, is a real challenge. Um, and interesting to hear about the Opera House, in fact, how perhaps the team didn't work as well, as well as it could have done. So how do you translate that to the, the day job? Um, I suppose it's the enthusiasm, making sure that people really work together and they have this common objective of, of excellence, which is what we strive for and which I know Arabs strive for as well. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a common architectural um, challenge, isn't it, the complexity of... Uh, all the various things we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. The slide that Nigel showed about the design team, typically, uh, you know, 10 years ago, where there was an m and &E consultant, uh, structural guy and a, an architect, and now there's the sort of a cast of thousands that's involved. It's a very difficult balance to, to strike. Um, personally, I think, and something that comes across in the exhibition here, is the playfulness that you can achieve. Um, with this, with this cast of people. I think that's really important to, to maintain that sense of humanity in this, um, in, this, in this kind of plethora of people that you have to deal with in the day to day. And certainly, you know, a sense of humor, and that's something that comes across in the, in the, in the exhibition. A sense of playfulness between all the parties. I think that's where, that's where true design comes from, really.